Well, this is the final in a six-week series. We've been doing the Servant King in a Selfish World, uh, chapters one through four and Mark. We'll come back to it in a later time and jump back in. This week, the Servant's King's Kingdom. Now, I'm, I'm going to have you look at a photo. Have you ever had a dinner at a place like this? Yeah. You know, you go to the jackpot and get yourself a, a corn dog, and it's just like that, right? Uh, Ron Frost, Dr. Ron Frost, our friend, has had dinner in a place like that. Ron, when he's getting his PhD in um, King's College, London, which is part of the Oxford University system, uh, once a year, there is a dinner like this at London House that is just for graduate students, but not all graduate students within the Oxford system. Uh, it's by special invitation. Ron was there for three years. He got invited twice. It's, not a, it's just a matter of space and such. So graduate students get to go to dinner there, and then they invite royalty, or those who are close to royalty and those highly placed in the, in the English society to have dinner. Well, Ron Frost was at one of these dinners. Let me describe to you what it was like. Obviously, everyone is dressed in formal attire. The graduate students come in and they are to be seated eventually. They start in a reception, I'll go there in a minute, at the table and uh, you are placed with a few people you know and a few people you don't know. Ron was across the table from Princess Diana's uh, personal secretary. He also had uh, one, of the, one of the men from the British uh, aerospace team, another uh, former uh, bishop of the church. Now, he says the evening begins with um, about a half hour reception. And he says, it's really something, you know, obviously everybody's dressed up and you bring your uh, invitation card and just like the movie says, and he, this week I called Ron, I said, Ron, may I tell the story, tell it to me again to make sure I really do it accurately. And he says, they take my invitation card and the guy stands up, Mr. Ron Frost. <laughs> really? That's me. I would have gone. No, Ron wouldn't have done that. And didn't, but he said, actually, that was so common in the course of the reception. It isn't like you turned around, but he says it was quite a deal. Then after about 30 or so minutes, then we're all ushered into the dining room proper, special seating, of course. Um, and he said, there's several other uh, protocols that take place. He says, one of those was that there was a Latin prayer before we ate. He goes, nobody knew what was said, but it was part of the deal. So we did it. And he says, and then we sit down and he says, the experience, Alan, was extraordinary because obviously the food they were about to consume was amazing. But he says the way it was served, for instance, he said, you would have, you'd have your salad served to you. And he says, as soon as you took your last bite, suddenly the, the plate was gone. And he says, and then comes the soup and it's just right. Very hot, delicious. You're eating your soup. And as soon as you're done with your soup, soup bowl's gone. He said, it was just like an invisible force in there. And he said, now, most people just experience the meal and experience the guest. He said, but I wanted to see, how is this happening with such precision? And he said, I, I was able to figure it out. There was a woman who we could call the house ruler. That is, she conducted, she had planned and conducted with minute precision exactly when everything was to happen. And she would stand just quietly, hardly moved. He says, I watched her. And so some servants would be around the room and she would watch and see that your tea needs to be refreshed. She would look, hardly move her head. She'd look over at a servant and suddenly you have new tea. You're done with your salad. It's gone. And he says, then what happened is when we all were served the entree at the exact same moment, here was this lady, she just nodded her head and out of the kitchen came 15 to 20 servers with plates all on their arms and we all were served exactly at the same moment. She was the house ruler. As he said, believe me, she knew what was going on. She, had a, she took care of everything. 
Then what happened at the conclusion of the meal when someone was going to get up and address the group, he says, I look over and she and all of them are gone. It was invisible, but it was so effective. Everything was carefully and thoroughly planned. And it was executed exactly as it was intended with little or no notice that anyone even carried out the plan. And they were virtually invisible. And the beauty and the pageantry and the sumptuous dining was because of them. Without them, there would have been chaos. When Jesus tells his parable in Mark chapter 4, he says the kingdom of God is like a farmer who does his part, he scatters seed on the ground. And then as a farmer, he goes on with his life. He passage says he sleeps, he wakes. And then he comes back and he goes, somehow, ooh, hey, thanks for showing up. That was cool. (laughs) We got people over here going, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) Thanks, buddy. Thanks for doing that. So the farmer comes back, he's just gone about his life, and everything's growing, and he has nothing to do with it. Because Jesus is making it clear that there is some one behind all, all that is happening, but it's not readily seen or understood by the farmer in this story. There is a house ruler who planned and carried out everything with flawless precision. And yet to our eyes, we have no perception of how this is all happening. Now, before we read the passage itself and we learn about this house ruler, I want to take us to a passage of just a couple of verses in Ephesians 1 that will frame our understanding and our thinking. You'll see it up on the screen. Ephesians 1. He, speaking of the heavenly father, made known to us the mystery, the secret, just like the parables, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration. I'll come back and explain this. Purposed in him, by the way, meaning Christ, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. Let me go back and unpack this a little bit to frame Mark 4. He, the heavenly father, made known to us the mystery. He's revealing to us of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, speaking of Christ. Kind intention. You know, many of us have numerous translations. Uh, obviously, if you have U version, you can just, man, it's, it's very cool. But our hard copy Bibles, um, maybe those of us who are in ministry have more than you do. We have quite a few. Uh, One of my favorite ones, if not my favorite one, is the New American Standard. And in this passage, when it says, according to his kind intention, has a little asterisk, and you go to the margin, it says, his good pleasure. The Father is having a good time. It brings him joy to use his son Jesus in him with a view to an administration. What in the world does that mean? Well, the Greek word, here's your little Greek lesson for today. Your Greek, the Greek word for administration is oikonomia. Oikonomia. You know what it means? House ruler. It means that Jesus is running everything, whether you're seeing it or not. It's right on time, men and women. There is not a thing that goes away from his notice. Man, if that lady's got it dialed in, she's looking and just kind of winks, and boom, they're doing stuff. When Jesus is running the planet, you're okay. So he says, with a view to an administration, the house ruler suitable to the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. In the latter part of chapter one of Ephesians, in a paraphrase, it says, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. What Jesus is doing is the only thing that matters. 
The only reason why you're breathing is because Jesus is making you breathe. For from him and through him and to him are all things, man. You want to be on his team because he's the house ruler and he's doing great stuff as complex as it is. We'll quote John Piper in a moment to help us understand. So number one, he is always working in every moment, in every situation. The parable of the growing seed, the house ruler is at work. Jesus also said the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground night and day when he's asleep and when he's awake. The seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. Greek word here, automate, automatically, by itself, no human help. First, a leaf blade pushes through. Then a head of wheat was, are formed. And finally, the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Now, something we want to notice, last week when Greg Kahlen was teaching us about the parable of the four soils, you know, the, good, the seed, seven times in that parable, Jesus defines, describes that the seed is God's word. Now, the parable we're looking at today it's during the same teaching. I mean, it, it's at the same time. This isn't another day, another afternoon. Jesus had just talked about the four soils. Now he's talking about the growing seed. So it's very fair for context to say when he says scatter the seed, he's speaking about God's word. Also, um, you'll notice as it says in the parable that um, the crop grows without help from the farmer. It's kind of like the high dinner. There's a whole lot going on that you don't know about. Uh, I suspect there's no one in the room who does this, and I'm sure Theta would affirm that I'm the only one that ever has. Um, I'll set it up this way. Do you like to go to really fine meals? Whew, I'm totally into this. It was great. Last hour, this one guy said, oh, I wouldn't feel comfortable there. I said, I would. <laughs> it was funny. He was talking about, I'd probably do something stupid. Well, um, I'm going to take one more cul-de-sac here for a second. Um, my father-in-law, Thetis' dad, uh, spoke of an extremely high dinner. Everybody's in tuxedos and the ladies are in lovely gowns. And he says it's so formal. We're all at these white tablecloth things. And it was a very high-end dinner for fundraising or whatever it was. And he says, I'm eating my dinner and I'm cutting the meat and my my knife slips and hits a pea. It hops down on the, right, on the white tablecloth, goes down three plates and goes up on this guy's plate. <laughs> and he goes, sorry, you just keep it. <laughs> he goes, it was a little embarrassing. Whether you're at somebody's house, but for instance, I was speaking at a family life event as the solo, you, always there was a couple and there was a solo husband. I was the solo husband speaker and it was Saturday night and I'm on my own and I went to a uh, restaurant in Anchorage. It was unbelievable. Whoa, it was so good. And so I've done this on occasion and since Theta wasn't with me, I didn't have to embarrass her. I went to the host and I said, could I please be allowed to go talk to the chefs? I want to thank them. There is so much going on. You're just thinking, man, this is outstanding. How many people go, I want in your kitchen? They're going, you're out. But I went in there and I said, thank you. Here's the point. There is so much going on that you don't know about. That the house ruler, the chefs, the house rulers are running it all. And the, and the farmer in this story, things are happening. And he goes, how'd that happen? So just at the high dinner at London House, so much is going on. And he's always working in every moment, in every situation. Now, the reality of Jesus' parable of the growing seed demonstrated the growth of the early church. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says this, The Lord has assigned to each of us his task. Everyone in this room who knows and follows Jesus, you have a place, you have a role. It matters what you do. He said, the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. You can't force spiritual life. That's the Holy Spirit's job. 
you know, in our role, both with our own souls, with our families that we love, uh, in our communities, in our state, our nation, in our world, we sow, we scatter the word of God, the seed, but then we've got to rest and realize that only the Holy Spirit can make people new. Isn't it easy to lose hope? I mean, just with yourself, do you meet your own expectations? I know the answer, absolutely not. Your family, who may be estranged from you or estranged from the Lord, people you love, and they're just so entrenched. This is who I am, and they think it's good. You know it will take an act of God to change them, right? Yeah. Towards the end of our passage, we'll be in it too in a few moments where Jesus calms the storm. <laughs> the boys are a little scared. The boat is going down. Jesus is asleep. He's cool. And they wake him up, said something you ought not to say to the Son of God. Don't you care? I know some of us try to be respectful, but we have the same feeling, don't we? Because there's situations, maybe it's you yourself, or it's people you love, or there's situations, or at the national level, or at the global level, you go, this is sickening, this is wrong, it's never going to change. But the house ruler says, you don't know all that's going on. You don't know all that's going on. He says, the farmer does his part, that's what we're to do, we're to sow the seed. Personally, familially, community, globally, locally, and only he can change people. Here's what John Piper says. This is so good. God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may only be aware of three of them. I don't know why you pick three, but you got to pick a number. Not only may you see only a tiny fraction of what God is doing in your life, but the part you do see may make no sense to you. You may find yourself in prison and God may be advancing the gospel among the guards and making the free brothers bold. Paul in prison. You may find yourself with a painful thorn and God may be making the power of Christ more beautiful in weakness. Uh, I've mentioned before someone who's terribly important in my life, a guy who's just, just God just kind of put him in my life, Walt Townsend. Walt's my, my buddy, my mentor, my coach. And uh, Walt says really unusual things. We would spend, now they live in Central Oregon, the, uh, Walt and I would be together two to three times a week uh, over 20 years. And uh, Walt says stuff like this. Alan, I want God to make me weaker tomorrow than I am today. Because when I am weak, what? Then he is strong. One time I was scheduled to speak. Um, one thing I would do with Walt is I'd say, hey, Walt, in two or three weeks, I'm supposed to speak on this passage. Would you take a look at it? Let's get together and... Tell me, what did you see? Well, there was one week I was scheduled to speak on, on the platform here on the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, if you do know who Walt is, that guy just walks in the spirit. There, there's no stress in that soul because the house ruler knows what he's doing and he trusts the house ruler. So when I'm speaking for weekend, Thursdays are game time. I mean, I cannot stand up here on a weekend. I said, I had the greatest conversations. I don't have an idea what this passage is about, but let me tell you about my talks. No, that doesn't work. Thursday is game time. I mean, you got to get it done, man. I mean, it's got to be done. But I thought, I cannot teach this passage on how to walk in the spirit and not talk to Walt. So Thursday, I do not have time. So I call Walt, Walter, can we get together for lunch so I can hear what you have to say about the passage? He goes, sure. So I rush into Chinese happiness and Gresham. I sit down. I am tense. I'm all wound up tight. And I sit down and he goes, how are you doing? I said, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. I says, I'm speaking on how to walk in the spirit. And you're doing it. And I'm all worked up. 
He just goes, how you doing, Alan? One of these days. <laughs> Alan, no one's coming to hear you speak. God forbid that they hear you. They have come to hear from Jesus. Don't get in the way. Alan, it's not your job to make something happen. The Holy Spirit, the house ruler. Alan, I'm praying that God will make me weaker tomorrow than I am today so that I will trust and rest in the house ruler. You may find yourself with a dead brother that Jesus could have healed and God may be preparing to show his glory. You may find yourself sold into slavery, accused falsely of sexual abuse and forgotten in a prison cell and God may be preparing you to rule a nation. Don't doubt the house ruler. He knows what he's doing. Therefore, no matter what you face, God will be doing 10,000 things in your life that you cannot see. Trust him, love him, and they will all be good for you. The house rulers got it. And if you try to make it happen, he'll just have to clean it up for you. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it, a, it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so my word in the parable, the seed, so my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve with the purpose for which I sent it. He is always working every moment in every situation the house ruler is running it all the second parable his work is deeper and more pervasive than you can imagine the parable of the mustard seed jesus said how can i describe it describe the kingdom of god what story should i use to illustrate it it's like it's like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can rest. Uh, birds make nests in its shade. Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables, but afterwards, he would, when he was alone with the disciples, he'd explain everything to them. Jesus' rule, the house ruler, Jesus' rule as Messiah begins really, really small. Very obscure. Very different as Greg Halen was reminding us last weekend from what the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders were expecting. They were expecting Messiah to come in and finally get them out from under the oppression of the Roman government. But Jesus' kingdom started really small. And we know that Jesus says in Matthew, he says, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. What does church mean? When I was growing up as a little boy, my parents didn't go to church. They dropped me off at church. To me, church was one of the most anemic words you could ever come up with. It was milk toast, spineless, boring, irrelevant. And then you understand what it means. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, called out community, called out of this perverse, dark, wicked, God-hating, spit-in-his-face world, and he calls out and builds the new community. It is the thing that's happening in the world. A few moments ago, I quoted this. I'm going to read it to you this time. Ephesians chapter 1 in a paraphrase. He, house ruler, is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. At the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he feels everything with his presence. So Jesus said, no one can stop the seed, the word of God, 
the Ecclesia, called out community from growing. A documentary produced by Frontier Alliance International Studios, Sheep Among Wolves, says right now, statistically, the fastest growing church called out community that follow love Jesus is in Iran. Millions and millions of Iranians are walking away from Islam and worshiping Jesus in underground churches. House ruler knows what's going on. The other nation, and there are others, but I'm just featuring these two. China. 1980s, the estimate was 3 million followers of Jesus. In the last decade, over 100 million. Well, I didn't know. That's okay. (laughs) You do your part to spread the seed here. Spread the seed in your family. Spread the seed to your friends, your community, to your globe, and then rest. You cannot, I, I, I can't fix me. I can't fix you. You can't fix you. Jesus can make you new. It can be a lightning bolt from God. Jesus does make people new. I've seen it. But if you're too wonderful, you don't get saved, rescued. Because you don't need one. But if you're as much a knucklehead as everybody else in this room, and you are, (laughs) and you'll admit it, (sighs) Holy Spirit makes you new. And it's pretty sweet stuff. And when you come to Jesus and when you learn to walk with him, the old man is dead. Now walk in newness of life. That's who you are. Well, I don't, no, you're not. That's why we come here every week. We kind of shake each other. Hey, buddy, I know who you are. Can you help me remember who I am? Jesus is making things new. The last portion of our passage, he's present and available in your distress and fear. Jesus calms the storm. Look at this boat on the Sea of Galilee. It's also called the Lake of Tiberias. It's a freshwater uh, body of water. Uh, This and the second one, when uh, Theda and I had an opportunity to be in Israel with Ralph and Myrna Alexander in 2010 for a 15-day tour of Israel. Uh, And we also were in Jordan. Whoa, and we were on boats just like that. I was speaking, you know, giving this message last night and a guy came up. He said that he and his wife were just in Israel a few months ago for a multi-day tour. And he described what their tour guide did, a 40-year-old man who obviously knows Christ and knows the Holy Land really well. You know, we had gone to the Sea of Galilee as part of our tour. And there is, you can go on the grassy slope that leads down to the Sea of Galilee where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. It's so beautiful. Well, this man was telling me last night that he and his wife were on that slope and their tour guide, why, why, it's just so gorgeous here looking out on this sea on this slope. The man stood up and recited from memory the entire Sermon on the Mount. I was telling Theta about that this morning. We both just kind of choked up. Go, whoa, what a good use of his mind, huh? Good for you, buddy. Plan the seed. Farmer. Well, God says it's not coming back void. So the Sea of Galilee. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him and they didn't say, "Uh, uh, we have a problem. Hey, don't you care? We're drowning. That's how they said it. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the wave, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then they, and then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? 
the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this guy? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, it shows Jesus' humanity. Uh, he'd been ministering count, you know, countless hours and days, crowds, healing people, speaking. He's, he's just exhausted. So when he gets out on the water, it's like, man, I got to get some rest. And it also shows his divine nature. He goes up, oh, by the way, wind, waves, knock it off. Okay, what do you guys want to talk about? All of us in this room, all of us in this room have storms going on. There is not a person in this room that is not experiencing pain. About yourself, about people you love, about how you wish life was different. It's not a clever phrase, it's a true statement. Jesus is in the boat with you. And when Jesus was rebuking the wind and the waves, as several scholars have noted, and I think, boy, that was a good insight. He says, yeah, he rebuked the wind and the waves, but he was really rebuking the one who caused the wind and the waves. Because likely Satan was trying to take him out before he'd land on the other shore and deliver that demoniac. Remember, it had multiple demons inside of him. <sighs> First John chapter 5, verse 19 says this, we know that we are the children of God. We know we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's why in Matthew chapter four, when Satan was tempting Jesus directly, he did offer the whole world because he had the whole world to offer. So Jesus obviously knew what Paul said in, in Ephesians 6, for we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present, present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Jesus stood up and rebuked them. Just like when he landed on shore, he got that guy free of all those demons. Remember all the way through the gospels where the demons go, oh, oh, it's you. What do you have to do with me, Jesus of Nazareth? Boy, they knew who he was. Well, here's where we're going to end. The house ruler. Go ahead and show the dining photo again, if you would. The house ruler. <laughs> oh, Ron. He goes, Phew. wasn't confused who was running that place. Although she never moved. She just... Nodded. She winked. Jesus, he knows what he's doing with your life. Go, but he knows what he's doing with your life. As Piper said, 10,000 things. He's doing 10,000 things in your world right now. Maybe you know one or two of them. If you were Joseph, stay in prison until I call you out. Don't quit. Be humble. Ask God to calm the storm in your soul. Let's pray. Jesus, you know the way with us. Our fear, our pride, our joy, our hopes, our failures. Oh, please, Jesus, calm the storm in these troubled hearts. Lord, I hope that most of us get to see what we pray for, but we know you teach us in your word that some of us will die in faith, knowing you're good, knowing you're competent, but we won't be alive to see when you finally change that heart. But in the meantime, we're not quitting. We trust you, the house ruler, and we pray in your name. Amen.